Good morning and a warm welcome to the 24th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2024. I'd like to put on record our thanks to Megan Gallagher for her work on the committee and wish her well in her new role in Local Government, Housing and Planning Committee. First agenda item is a declaration of interest and a warm welcome to Stephen Kerr, MSP, who joins the committee today and can invite you to declare any relevant interests. Well, it's a pleasure to join you and other colleagues and to serve under your convenership. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. Our second agenda item is to begin to take evidence on the second phase of our inquiry in relation to the review of the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The committee published its report on the first phase of the inquiry, focus on trade and goods, in September. And this second part of the inquiry will focus on trade and services and mobility. This morning, we are joined by Dr Adam Marks, International Policy Executive at the Law Society of Scotland. Good morning. Dr Ross Anderson, Advocate, Faculty of Advocates and Online Professor David Collins, Professor of International Economic Law, City of St George's, University of London. And uh, if I could begin with a couple of questions, um, I'll then invite members um, to indicate if they want to come in and hopefully we'll be able to uh, accommodate supplementaries um, from the committee this morning. So um, if I could just ask, what are the biggest concerns arising from the TCA for the legal services provision? And are you able to offer any solutions? And thinking more positively, are there any upsides to um, the, the TCA at the moment? And per perhaps I could bring, begin with Professor Collins. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Yes. Uh, great, thank you. So I, I think what, what was essentially asked, what are the, the negatives and then the positives? And I think the the negative aspect of the TCA with respect to legal services is that there are so many reservations at the member state level. And that's why I think it, it can be a bit misleading if you look at the legal services provisions of the TCA uh, to, to think that uh, they've been liberalized uh, when they, they haven't really much beyond what we already had at the WTO level with the GATS agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. So people sometimes say, and I've said this, uh, that the TCA was a weak agreement because it, it only focused on goods and it didn't focus on services. Well, of course, it does have services. Legal services are included, but there's so many reservations at the member state level. So you have to look at, at the uh, non-conforming measure uh, in the annexes to see what the reservations are from each of the member states, which are actually quite substantial. Uh, and uh, which is, and by saying substantial, I mean to say that they don't really go that much deeper than what we already had under the WTO, and uh, and they don't go beyond what the EU has granted typically in other free trade agreements. Now, the positive, which I, I guess I've sort of, uh, sort of already said, but I, I maybe should underline, is the fact that legal services were mentioned at all, which is a really good thing, and I, I think it, it's a good sign that the the EU and the UK are mindful of the importance of legal services to our economies. Uh, and uh, this is reflected in some other free trade agreements out there, like the CPTPP and so on, where you're seeing legal services. Um, so we do have this basic provision, which allows uh, uh, legal services providers from the EU and from the UK to provide designated legal services, which is uh, home state law public international law and arbitration. And we also see reference to these new categories that aren't in GATS, uh, like um, intracorporate transferees and, and, and one or two other ones that were not mentioned in the GATS. So I think there's an awareness there and there is a framework in place which in theory could be used to more fully liberalize uh, legal services in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marks? Yes, yeah, so I, th I think I'd, I'd build um, on what Professor Collins said just by saying that the TCA does provide a basis to start. And I think whatever has happened in the past, there, there is now a, a good sort of way forward that we can see to build from this. 
I think just for context, it's worth just thinking about sort of the members of the Law Society and what I'm, I'm representing talking about are really sort of two sets of people here, which are sort of individual members and solicitors who are currently based in the EU across the member states. Some have gone for economic reasons and business reasons, some have gone for family reasons, and we're talking about predominantly the larger firms which are interested in doing legal services advice abroad. We're talking mainly about what we call fly in, fly out, so the ability to get on a plane, advise a client, fly back, um, and get paid for that, which is the slight kicker at the moment in the issue. Um, the home title practice is very useful for that. Whilst they can't advise on EU law, they can advise on international law, on arbitration, on a lot of the work that they would be doing anyway. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of look at what we can challenge and change going forward. So I think there is definitely roots within the, the TCA, Article 126, which I'm happy to talk about later, where we can explore changing that. Um, the next few years, I think, potentially present, again, that opportunity through the review process. Um, the review process, which you know, has been referred to by many people. I mean, I will actually read out loud, if you don't mind, what the review process is, just to remind everyone quite how vague it is. Um, the parties shall jointly review the implementation of this agreement and supplementing agreements and any matters related thereto five years after the entry into force of this agreement and every five years thereafter. And that's it. So this is something that lots of people have projected lots of ideas onto, I think it's fair to say. Um, my advice and thoughts on my side would we, we sort of approach this in a way that is constructive and that actually gives things that we can deliver. So actually look into the TCA and work there rather than going beyond that. Um, so from our side, I'd, I want to look at areas around transparency, which is definitely things that we can do through Article 145, mobility, and in a broader terms, I think there's opportunities to look at youth mobility as well. And I think in this context, the sort of reset of relations that we've had recently is quite useful between the UK government, the new UK government and the new commission as that comes into play. I think that could set at least some good muse music, whatever else. And I don't think we've seen anything concrete so far, but it's all very early days. Um, and then let's see, see what we can build from that. Um, and I think I'd comment just specifically on that, that the fact that trade on an EU level is now being handled by DG Trade rather than its own separate part in the new portfolios of the Commission is quite interesting and worth watching. The EU are pressing this as a, this is the normalisation of relations. And I suppose on the positive side, anything that takes sort of the high drama out of the last few years is probably a good thing. It also places us very much as one amongst that many. We are on the same footing as everyone else with a trading relationship with the EU, and I think we need to be mindful of that as we approach them going forwards. And I'd just like to finally sort of thank the committee for the work we've previously done. We did um, finally get to have missions ourselves and the faculty to the domestic advisory group of the TCA. I know many members of this committee and former members of this committee um, did raise this issue on our behalf, and we're very grateful for the support you've given us in the past. So thank you for that. Thank you. Dr. Anderson. Um, I'm grateful, um, and I'll, I'll start just by reiterating the point that um, Dr Mark's made in relation to our, our thanks to the committee for the support we, we've received in relation to, to that. Um, to answer the questions, I think I would probably start um, with the observation of comparing where we were before the TCA to where we are now, because that really provides the practical context um, for us as lawyers and in, 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 um, in the case of the faculty as, as advocates. Um, in the EU, there are really three aspects to um, uh, the provision of legal services which were, were, were key. The first was that we could provide advice across the EU um, to EU-based clients on, among other things, EU law as a Scottish lawyer. Um, the second thing was is that we had a right of audience, that's to say, um, we could appear in EU courts and tribunals, so in the same way as I could appear in Glasgow Sheriff Court or um, the Court of Session, also had a right of audience before the General Court or the Court of Justice of the European Union, as well as various other European tribunals. And then finally, thirdly, there was an additional aspect to all of this, that under the directives there was the mechanism whereby um, one could uh, register in another EU country and actually un under home title and provide advice on the national law of that country. Um, and there were mechanisms that after a particular period, one could then become qualified. Now, 
of those three, it was really the first two that were of the most importance, just being able to give the advice in EU law and to have the right of audience. And, and those are the, the, the rights which have been lost post-Brexit. And that loss is really embedded in the definition of designated legal services because it excludes EU law. Um, and more generally, we don't have the right of audience. Um, the, the third aspect, which is kind of tied to mutual recognition of professional qualifications under the TCA, um, was a central aspect of the scheme, but in a practical sense, it was less important. Um, so um, that's where we were, and obviously under the TCA, we, we no longer um, have uh, those uh, rights. Um, I mentioned the definition of designated legal services from the perspective of my own professional body, because as advocates, what we do on a day and daily basis is, is appear before courts and tribunals. So, um, uh, so that major aspect of our practice is just eliminated by the effect of, of, of Brexit. And there's not really anything in the TCA that looks as if that will ever change. Um, but on the advisory side, um, that, that the limitation in there uh, in relation to EU law is also crucial. Um, and has um, a significant practical uh, implications. Um, for that reason, therefore, um, in terms of um, upsides, well, at least legal services are mentioned, um, but from the perspective of, of, of advocates, um, the content of that is, is much more limited uh, in terms of what we are um, able to uh, undertake. Um, and therefore, in terms of the, rev the review process, which Dr. Marks um, referred to, to some extent, in terms of the world being or looking at what is the art of the practical, then that revision exercise probably does relate to basic aspects in relation to freedom of movement, of actually being able to travel to provide such advisory designated legal services as we're allowed to do. Okay, thank you um, for those opening. Uh, remarks. Um, I was wondering if um, uh, transparency was mentioned, uh, and one of the themes that we saw in um, our, our trade inquiry was um, a, a sort of um, ask for more government support and more advice and more um, support to the profession. Is that something that you would welcome? Something that's needed, or do you think that's something that's going to grow? Um, you know, just naturally um, within the profession as, as you're negotiating the, the TCA going forward? I mean, I sort of, yes, support is always welcome. Um, I, th I think part of the issue that we face in terms of the sort of clarity and the transparency of understanding is just that ultimately we are now facing 27 jurisdictions at least. In some member states, we're talking about regional or state level, have different rules on mobility, different rules on what you can and can't do. And I think it's just that understanding. And partly, I would say there is an inevitability that over time, this is still a relatively young agreement, particularly when you take into account the COVID travel freeze, understanding will come. But I think certainly in the immediate future, there is far more room for um, clarity of sharing of information about what you can do from member states um, and article 145 that commits both sides to that is something that I should think should be developed and pushed forward. Um, I, I don't think this has to be just part of the review process. I think this can be done in wider relations. There's an awful lot of areas around the TCA which don't need that formal review process. I don't think there's any need to, to, to wait. We can start now on this work. And I think the previous government has done some work on it. I assume that this will continue under the new government trying to understand what is is possible in each area um, and I think just sort of briefly to sort of add the reason I have some optimism that this is possible is that there have been some specific issues on certain member states with the compatibility of what their legal framework was with the TCA and there's been quite good work done already even amongst the sort of sea of high politics to, to change that. Um, I mean, there's, there's lawyers in Greece, for instance, which is primarily affected by um, lawyers that are in maritime shipping stuff, which has been resolved to a large degree. I confess it's more English lawyers that were affected by that than, than Scottish solicitors. Um, but then Luxembourg, which definitely did affect Scottish solicitors um, straight after the signing of the TCA, out of no particular design or fault of Luxembourg, the way their law was written, it immediately made it illegal to practice home title or international law in Luxembourg. Um, last year now, the Luxembourg Parliament passed a bill to change that, 
And as far as we can tell, that has actually gone through in a positive way and does seem to have resolved the issue. So I do think there is way to build on this is the sort of good news within it. And, and so just increasing that understanding will throw up more issues like this, and then we continue to, to work our way through them as they come up on a case-by-case -case issue, because I'm sure there will be more. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's sort of a double side to the transparency that can, can really help. Okay. Dr Anderson, you mentioned it. I think you want to comment on transparency a bit further. Um, uh if I did, I, I don't remember um, doing so. To, um, I, I think, to be frank, I don't really have anything on transparency to add. I mean, mm -hmm. we have the fundamental issue of there being now 27 different legal regimes, so um, um, a, a greater clarity as to what's required in each um, state is, is obviously welcome. But uh, otherwise, I don't really think I've got anything useful to add to what Dr Marks has said. Uh, Professor Collins, do you want to comment? Uh, yes, I, I'd like to pick up on what both uh, Dr. Marx and Dr. Anderson said, which I agree with entirely, I don't think it's really about transparency. It really is about clarity. And you, you need to be careful with the concept of transparency, especially when you're dealing with the EU, because the EU likes to bombard its trade partners with a, uh, an abundance of information, perhaps excessively so, that becomes hard to manage. Now, if you look at some of the append uh, appendices of the TCA, they're absolutely overwhelming in their in their meticulousness and their in their level of detail. So I don't think we could fault the, the the EU or the TCA for a lack of transparency. For the most part, the material is there. The question is the clarity, uh, such that it becomes usable for uh, for practitioners, particularly ones that aren't part of big firms that don't have the resources to. to to uh, parse through this information. So it, I think clarity is what we need um, rather than, uh, than more and more of, of these uh, sort of documents coming out, which, um, which often don't provide uh, a path forward. We have all these frameworks, but we, we, we don't get a, a, a progress in, in, in terms of what the actual expansion of the, of the market access is. Okay. I'm going to move to questions from the committee and bring in first Mr Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Kavinda. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, out of the 27 member states, are there member states that we in the legal profession yourself find that you can work with? Uh, and there are, are, are certain countries that are more amenable. And if that is the case, uh, who are they and why are they uh, more amenable? Or why do the legal profession find it easier? Uh, uh, and are there some that are just not used at all because of the complexities of, you talked about Luxembourg there, uh, uh, in, a, in a situation, uh, and that's now been resolved. But are, is that the majority of the member states are in that ca capacity, or, or, as I say, are there ones that are more favourable to working with you, you find easier to go uh, and have uh, negotiations with? I, I think it's, it's not necessarily... That states are more amenable or not. I think there is a sort of inevitability that economic interests of Scotland and where lawyers end up means they do end up in more states, certainly in more countries than others. I mean, I, I think if you look at the spread of our members, you'd be unsurprised to find there's, there's a cluster around Brussels just because mm -hmm. Brussels is a bubble. We have a cluster in Luxembourg, Court of Justice of the EU. Um, but then again, you'll find them in Paris, you'll find them in Berlin, you know, you'll find them in Scandinavia, particularly around sort of energy projects, in-house lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of the businesses there. In terms of specific problems with the TCA when it started, the two that really reared their heads were Luxembourg and, and, and to a lesser extent for, to us, but I know it was important to law citing mean, than Wales, Greece. Um, and again, I, I don't think it was that you know, Luxembourg and Greece were unamenable. I think it's just that unfortunately the way their law was written did not anticipate the TCA and it has taken some time for that to just get sorted out. Um, but as I say, it's still relatively early days in this, mm. this process. Um, I think it's all about with most of these, you know, the fly-in, fly-out type stuff as a starting point is the building of the relationships that then develops into something more. Um, and, I, and I think sort of that is the sort of the starting key to this rather than sort of particular barriers in a particular state. Um, lawyers are inevitably, I suspect, you know, unsurprised, cautious. And so I think when there is a sort of lack of clarity about you can, when you, you can or can't do something, you're not going to get gung-ho lawyers, which is a, hopefully a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that clarity does matter, as, as Professor Collins was talking about. 
Does uh, Dr Anthony want to answer anything on that too? No, no and, and actually it's difficult, I think, to, to answer the question and to generalise really for the practical reason that g given the relative size of our profession, these issues generally arise on an individual basis for the individual lawyer going to a particular country and therefore the professional bodies as such won't necessarily know about the difficulties that a particular individual has in Berlin or Paris or Marseille or wherever it might be. Um, and if we don't know about it, um, we don't know about it. And also, we don't really have an impression, I would have thought, whether at the Law Society or the faculty, um, uh, uh, to have any sort of meaningful feedback that would allow us to generalise in that way beyond the two examples that, that Dr Marks has given. And, and following on from that, I mean, what, what suggestions do you have as, a, as a organisations as to what you think should happen next? Because it has been, yes, a short time scale has taken place between where we are, but there has to be progress for the future. Uh, and some of the barriers are now being managed better, uh, and, the, and the relationship has improved in some locations. So, so what, what is your wants and needs for the future to ensure that the legal profession do have and continue to have a relatively seamless trance going forward as to what you want to achieve? I think I mentioned previously what's in the art of the possible, and fr from our perspective, the fundamental difficulty is, is that what we've lost is not something that looks as if it's on the table, which is the opportunity to appear in European courts and tribunals. And what our members and, um, uh, um, at the faculty, um, and the same I think is true of the Law Society of Scotland, um, uh, have done if they want to do that, is they have gone to professional bodies in other, in other countries, whether that's in Ireland or in Belgium, and they have sought admission to the bars of those countries. Um, so, you know, on a practical level, to actually get what we actually want, to be honest, mm. um, that is something different than what is likely to be achievable under the revision regime. Um, that having been said more generally, I think it would be fair to say that the relationship between the professional bodies in the United Kingdom and their counterparts throughout the EU are generally good. Mm -hmm. um, um, and beyond that, in terms of the art of the practical and the things that can be done, um, Dr Marx has already referred to things around um, travel, for example, and under Article 126, and I should probably a a allow him to speak about that one. Dr. Yeah, Marks? Ha happy to. So, um, sort of within the TCA as it stands, the sort of short term business visitor um, mobility section is what I, th I think is particularly interesting. This is sort of in the treaty, it's outlined as sort of Articles 142 to 145 generally, if you're wanting to go digging. Um, but crucially, sort of short term business visitors are allowed to do 90 days in a six month period um, with certain reservations. The problem at the moment is one of the key reservations is you can't make any money whilst you're doing it. So, I mean, in goods, it's almost easier to explain in the sense of goods. You're allowed to visit a trade show, but you're not allowed to sell anything without having the appropriate uh, visa from the member state that it's in. What I think it is important to do is that there are certain broader exemptions. In particular, there's one on commercial transactions, um, which allows management and supervisory personnel and financial services personnel, including assurances, bankers and investment brokers, to engage in commercial transactions. I think it would be fair to say it would be useful to add legal services to this list. If legal services could be included, then you would bring back the ability to do that short-term fly-in, fly-out advice under home title practice which is something that is, is definitely doable. Article 126, it says, will be reviewed and looked at during the review process. So it's something that is firmly within the remit of what that is, um, even within the limited grey areas of what's been defined. So I think as far as asks as a constructive moving forwards, we should be looking at that for legal services. Frankly, though, legal services is what I'm interested in. Probably some other sectors might be interested in it as well and, and see what can be done over the next few years as we look through that process. Thank you. And Professor Collins, anything you'd like to add? Uh, there's, there's a few uh, comments that I, I would make. If I could perhaps pick up on, on the, the previous question, I was a member of the International Committee of the Law Society of England and Wales for a number of years and had some experience with the endeavours of, of that uh, association to make uh, agreements with the various bars around uh, Europe. 
my recollection was Cyprus was probably the most forthcoming because it uh, it is a common law jurisdiction, maybe the only one in the EU, uh, other than England and Wales. Uh, and uh, th there were various arrangements created. I think the the other members of the committee, I'm sure, would have more knowledgeable about this than I would. There was an agreement reached with France uh, on on with, with some kind of a, a recognition uh, provision. With respect to improvements uh, for the TCA in terms of the text of the agreement, one of the concerns, and this is what I alluded to in, in the, the, the the blog piece that I'd written many years ago, and, and it went back to it and and um, struggled with the article numbers and wasn't quite sure what, what I was referring to. But anyway, if you look at Annex 22 of the TCA, it only references uh, contractual service suppliers and independent uh business professionals. There's no reference to intercorporate transferees or um, uh, business uh, business visitors for established purposes, uh, establishment uh, purposes, uh, some, uh, however that acronym works. So I was very concerned that, that there was an omission for those two categories. And I, I, that to me, uh, the, the, the omission of that suggested to me that those other categories were not really uh, uh, not really in sort of sort of in, in the uh, the mindset of, of what the TCA was looking at with regards to liberalization. So I would like to see those categories specifically addressed, and the reference to legal services in that provision, the provision again on uh, contractual service suppliers and independent professionals. I would like to see broader language. Legal services is the first one listed under contractual service suppliers. And it says to quote legal advisory services in respect of public international law and home jurisdiction law. I would like to see more detail on that. Meeting with clients, um, charging clients. The, that, that's a to me that's a very thin provision. Uh, so that's where I would like to see progress in the TCA. But of course, I would like to see more commitments at the member state level. Uh, especially in rela relation to recognition of uh, foreign qualifications. Thank you, convener. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to our guests. Um, for obvious reasons, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, EU member states. There's w one comment was made about non-EU member states and the, the idea that we are now in the position that they are in, in trying to, to work with the EU and I wonder if there's a little bit more that can be drawn out there about um, are we now in exactly the same position as other non-EU member states that want to work with EU jurisdictions? Do they have similar arrangements in place, those that have a high level of economic relationship with, with Europe? Do they have similar arrangements in place that, that, that's in the TCA? And have they developed over time? Because if we're looking to see the TCA or, or whatever develops out of it, deepen and, and enrich over time. Are there any lessons that can be drawn from other countries uh, which are outside the EU and have some of the same issues around lack of freedom of movement and the, the impact that has on, on services? Uh, have, have they found solutions? Um, <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me if, if I characterise that as a really difficult question, Good. because um, <laughs> um, which I, I appreciate is, is no doubt the job of the committee uh, to ask difficult questions. But th the reason I say that is because, as I've indicated, we're now in a situation where we've got the, the 27 different uh, regimes that yep. apply within the EU against the background as a, of the United Kingdom previously having been a member state of the EU. So that is at least a sort of known quantity. Yep. Insofar as your question is directed at a comparative analysis of the relative position of non-EU member states, um, um, that is obviously much more difficult for us to, to know. It's not something that we've conducted research about. Um, and so um, I'm not really in a position to answer that question. Um, I suppose what I would say, however, is that the TCA is a significant international agreement. Um, and the uh, provisions within that agreement which um, extend to legal services, it seems to me, on first principles, and subject to the caveat that I've just mentioned of not having conducted the research, um, 
must surely put us in, I would have thought, a, a better or at least um, um, desirable position than, than would be the situation if we didn't have the TCA and we were just standing outside of that on ordinary WTO um, uh, grounds. So, um, acknowledging the, the, the difficulty of, of not really being able to comment um, on the comparative analysis, it seems to me that um, the TCA provisions such as they are are, are, are something to build on. Any other uh, views? I was going to say, I mean, I, I, I think with, with probably broadly similar caveats, but I think it's worth considering that, yes, we need to see what the new structure in the Commission looks like when it all comes out to the wash and everything and what the actual reality is. Really, the point I was making is I think we are going to have to work to engage uh, with the EU in a way that, you know, historically as a member of the EU, we didn't. But I think we all kind of know this anyway. I think there's an interesting question about how close we are and, and, and sort of legacies of our membership. Um, for instance, so we, uh, both faculty and, our, and the Law Society, sit as two members of the UK delegation to the CCBE, which is the sort of European-wide bars and law societies. Um, Post-Brexit, we are not full members anymore because the various subject committees that have exclusive competence for the Commission and for EU matters, we no longer have voting rights on. But we do have voting rights on a lot of the other committees, and we attend those committees where we do not have voting rights. Still, we have a sort of associate status, it's called. And I think it sort of shows sort of how we can build and develop relations anyway going forwards. I mean, our experts are still there. They are still in the room. They are still being asked their opinion on things. Quite often, Scottish listers, English listers are experts in their fields. Um, and I think there is quite a lot of, you know, room for collaboration still. And I think going forwards, we, we need to build on this, as, as Dr. Anderson has said. It's, it, it's looking towards the future from what we've now got and what is possible. And I think there is some possibilities within this. Mm. I mean, so slightly comparable to, you know, the, whether you're in the room as politicians or civil servants at, at that level, you know, very often we are, but with, with a lesser status or with, uh, with less opportunity to, to influence discussion. Um, but at the same time, the EU... I think there is a kind of move away from the idea that accession is just a binary you're in or you're out process and, and the idea that there's a, more of a graduated uh, change for countries that seek EU membership to, to gradually integrate. And it seems to me that the position that, that this country is now in, even though I might wish we one day become a re-accession country, uh, whether it's Scotland or the UK, whether or not that happens, there's presumably space for a level of integration that addresses some of the issues we're discussing today that's, that's comparable to, to that which the EU now explores for countries that are seeking membership. Am I going too far there? Um, I, mean, I, I think that may well be right. I mean, whatever has happened politically, um, doesn't change the shared history that we have of, of um, being a member state of the EU. The vast body of EU law that continues to exist under whatever name, whether it's assimilated law or retained EU law and, and under U UK uh, legislation. Um, and, of course, in an informal sense, the various bodies which continue to operate on a pan-EU level, such as the CCB or the European Law Institute and so on, in relation to which UK lawyers continue to play an active role. Um, so where matters go next are, are really political questions um, with which you know, we have an entirely neutral um, uh, approach. But um, given the shared background, you know, although there's been a political break, that doesn't mean that there's necessarily been, you know, a practical break um, for the professionals. Thank you. Uh, unless Professor Collins wants to add anything. Yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll make a few comments on that. To, to respond to the, what was the initial question, does that mean that the UK is dealing as, as any third country? The TCA is a, is a very good agreement uh, that that exceeds GATS. Uh, the, 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 the WTO uh, agreement, which would apply to all of the uh, countries that don't have preferential free trade agreements with the EU, is covered by the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And the TCA is better than that, but only in a small way. Um, to, to, I, I believe I mentioned this before. 
there are several categories of personnel mentioned in the TCA that are not included in GATS, independent professionals, short-term business visitors, graduate trainees, uh, for example. But the real value in the TCA is its potential because, again, it creates this framework, the Partnership uh, Committee, uh, the Trade and Services and Investment and Digital Trade Committee, which uh, meets, I uh, believe, annually. And these committees are designed to promote uh, integration in, in the with regards to mutual recognition uh, and so on and that, that's quite an extensive framework if you look at some of the meetings of these committees that have taken place the most recent set of minutes that are available are from the meeting that took place the services committee uh from october of 2023 and they talk about progress towards transparency towards mutual recognition for legal services legal services is, is expressly mentioned you're never going to see that in Geneva under the WTO at GATS. They simply don't have that uh, enthusiasm for, for liberalizing under the GATS. Uh, and I can make this as sort of a sweeping statement. The future of liberalization in services, of all services around the world, will not be through the GATS. It will be done bilaterally. So the interesting question is, has the EU made any commitments as good as this any, under any of its other free trade agreements. And my limited research into this shows that probably the, the CETA with Canada is, is the most comparable one. Uh, and that again is, is better than GATS, but it's all about creating the framework. And uh, as my reading of, of the political tea leaves uh, at the moment is the EU at least doesn't seem to be willing to negotiate mutual recognition agreements for services. Uh, the UK would like to, and I think the Prime Minister has uh, identified that he prioritizes that, but I'm not convinced that the EU has much appetite for that right now. So the question becomes, if we want that, if, if we genuinely want these commitments for mutual recognition, what can the UK offer reciprocally uh, in, in order to gain those concessions? And it might be, well, access to our legal services, but I think we've been quite a bit more open. Or it could be greater access with respect to goods, perhaps. But again, I think we've been pretty open there. The, the problem with the UK is we've, we've run out of things to offer reciprocally uh, as uh, negotiation chips uh, to the EU. Thank, Thank you, you. Kevina. Mr. Kerr. Maybe just pick up on that point, because uh, you know I'm not a lawyer, um, so I don't quite grasp some of this. So you have to help. Um, the reciprocation. So particularly in relation to Dr. Anderson's comments about audience. When we were members of the European Union, was there a high incidence of EU lawyers coming and appearing before British courts? Um, high incidence. Because um, you, you used the term right of a audience. major aspect in relation to advocates appearing in, in EU courts. In EU courts, yeah. But what and, about and, the other direction? Well, of course, the, the first aspect in relation to the central EU courts was that that was something that applied to all EU lawyers. So a German lawyer could appear before the EU courts, a British... Uh, yeah, English I mean... In, in the reciprocity at the national level yes. um, is a good question, is that that was the third aspect I said of yeah. the three things that I mentioned. The right of audience for the European courts was the second. The third was before the national courts. And it's correct to say that that was of less practical importance. It did happen from time to time, but not, but not, not in a, on, on, on and, in, the in relation to the quantum between that happening here and our advocates appearing in an EU setting. I, I understand what you're saying about the EU courts, the actual courts, but I'm talking about the national setting. Yes, I mean, I, I, again... I, it's quite hard to find statistics or figures because they're not kept yeah. as to the extent yeah. to which Scottish lawyers would have sought to have registered in, say, France and appeared under their home title before a French court. For obvious reasons, one of the reasons that happened relatively infrequently were things like language and ultimately clients normally want to be represented before a national court by somebody who is recognised and has pled before those national courts. Yeah. So. That was why I said, to, to be frank, it was the, f the first it, two... You're of the really talking about appearances before EU courts, Correct. then? Yeah. yeah. It did happen, as I say, appearance before national courts, whether European lawyers appearing here... But not or, much. But not so much. Okay. Because of the issue of preferring to have someone that's in situ 
understands the nuances of the legal system the, and her the, procedures. These were, these were much more sort of practical and commercial considerations rather yeah. than a legal consideration in terms of the framework. And Dr Marks, in relation to FIFO, or FIFO, as you've described it, you said you, know, you fly in, you do some legal business. You've, I'm imagining most of that would be commercial, yes. contract related. Yes, that's what we're doing. So you go in and you're giving, you are permitted under the, the uh, agreement to give uh, legal advice on UK related matters, mm -hmm. Scottish related matters, yeah. and international legal matters. But you said even with that permission to give that those legal services, commercial, contract, you can't invoice? So that's or all can you invoice so you, you could invoice as long as you have entered the country under the appropriate visa, because it's, it's the visas system right. that's the issue here, rather than what you can and can't do. So this is then about you know, making sure that you have a short-term business mobility visa for wherever you are going to be at France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So the, the FIFO yeah. only... So it, it's all theoretical then, because well, without the invoicing, there's no yes. point going. Well, well it, and then that's the problem, that at the moment everyone has to do the country-by-country country visa, which is right. obviously the compl complicated part. Which is the transparency yes. issue. And, and yeah. it's also therefore why I was sort of hoping that if we can, under Article 126, get legal services added to the list of the TCA's short-term yeah. business ability, then you would automatically have this ability to So you to wouldn't have it. to get the local... Correct. Yeah. You could just do it under, you know, and you're not then worrying about all of those different... But, rules and regulations but currently currently you fly in with the necessary as long as you have the right visa yes. then you can invoice yeah, yeah. right okay that's clear it's just the scale of this that interests me i mean so i'm going to go to something that actually professor collins sent us i think sent us um i'm going to read this because I, i'm trying to understand the scale of the issue um, he, because he, what, what, what you said, Professor Collins, is although the incomplete coverage of legal services, both market access and mobility in the TCA is a cause of concern for some UK lawyers, whether it is a significant practical problem for the UK legal profession as a whole is unclear. The number of UK qualified lawyers that had been providing advice on EU law or the laws of EU member states was almost certainly small relative to the size of the profession and the value of the transactions before Brexit. Now, that's, I'm not going to ask Professor Collins whether he agrees with that, because he wrote it. But Dr Marks and Dr Anderson, do you agree with that kind of conclusion statement that uh, Professor Collins gave us? Um, I mean, that was a passage I had highlighted um, my, my, <laughs> my, myself. I think I, I wouldn't disagree with it in relation to advice on the laws of EU member states, because inevitably a British lawyer, whether in Scotland or England, is unlikely to be wanting to give advice in relation to the laws of Germany or France. But, but in relation to giving advice on EU law, whether to um, British-based clients or to clients based in the EU, um, I think our members would have considered that to be a very significant, a significant um, aspect um, of uh, the practice that they undertook. And, and what about members of the Law Society? What's your response to Professor Collins' statement? I, I think I would sort of, building on that, it was, it was certainly an a important issue to our larger firms because they have raised this as an issue since. In terms of coming here with some data to, to, to provide it, it, it gets very difficult very quickly um, to show what that actually is. Yeah. But it is something that is raised regularly by our larger as firms. Is it a nuisance factor or is it a real impediment to business? I think it's more, at least to some extent, to come back to sort of the members who are overseas already, they've sort of worked out ways to make this yeah. work for yeah. now. There is a fear about does this sort of wither on the vine rather than growing as we go forwards? And it's that sort of future, do we develop new clients? Are we meeting the new clients? Because we're not doing this previous body of work we were doing. You know, how is this going to, to develop and what's, what's the future of the firm in this, mm. in this region? Um, and I, I think it's that sort of area that worries. I mean, in, in terms of grand scale of like what we're talking about here, I always think it's 
fairly, you know, you look at what the English solicitor profession has and the scale of the magic circle in terms of their, their economy. Largely in Scotland, take everything and divide by 10. I mean, in terms of a section of the economy, legal services is pretty similar in Scotland to England. Mm. You know, in terms of our membership, it's divide by 10 pretty much. Um, in terms of international representation, they have 10 members of staff, I have me. Um, you know, every, everything divides by 10 quite neatly. So I, th I think it's sort of the same level and that it does make it a significant important part. And I'd add that particularly with legal services, it's worth remembering that it's not just legal services that we end up with this. Because quite often having your own solicitors that you know, um, yes, you wouldn't do local court appearances with them, but that's the sort of glue that bound, binds a lot of everything else together. If you are you know, looking to defend your intellectual property, if you're looking to sign a contract, whatever it is, you will need somebody to advise you on that. And I think sort of there is a sort of cumulative effect in other sectors that comes from legal services, just as the other way around, for instance, the energy sector does drive a lot of in-house work, which then provides work for legal services. Like there is a sort of more mm. than just us element to this that, that runs through a lot of it. So I think it's, yes, there is a significant part to us, but also then beyond that it builds. But there's always been a significant element of cross-border collaboration anyway, hasn't there? I mean, you, sure. if you're a Scottish business, you go to your Scottish lawyer, but they then speak to a French lawyer, yes. for example. So, yeah. I mean, and, and that still continues, right? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, so, uh, Professor Collins, what was the basis upon which you reached this conclusion? Yes, I, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, t just as you know, I wrote that some three years ago now, and I, and I, I was only sort of reacquainting myself with it. I think I wrote a more substantial piece as an academic legal article, which I could have looked into if, if I'd known I was I was going to be asked uh, 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 about it. But I, I can answer your question anyway. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I'm, I was on the International Committee of the Law Society of England and Wales for about te 10 years. Um, we had many, many discussions about these issues. And the sense was, was from conversations with practitioners, exactly the point that you just made. If you have business in the Czech Republic, you don't fly to the Czech Republic and, and do it. You hire the Czech guy who you know. You've got your Czech guy. You've got your Spanish guy. And the, and the big, not even huge, medium-sized, smallish law firms have their go-to professionals in all of the member states. It does not make sense to send people there to do that. And the people in those jurisdictions don't want the British guy showing up saying, oh, I'm exercising my establishment rights and I'm going to tell you about EU law. They want someone who's an expert there who knows the Spanish legal system in the EU. That's just how business is done. So that 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 was why the sense that I had as Brexit unfolded is that I, in fact the legal services profession probably wasn't going to be harmed by it as much as had been thought. In fact, the legal services probably uh, profession probably benefited from it, providing advice to clients how to deal with Brexit in the short term. So I, it, it, I think. This is perhaps one of the myths, I think, uh, uh, about uh, trade and services and Brexit, that, that, that there was going to be this huge interruption. There hasn't really been because there's ways around it, which is phoning up the guy that you know or, and you, you can hire. So uh, I, I would say, and I don't have the statistics at hand, but I, I, I would say that trade and legal services hasn't dropped significantly. Um, now that isn't to say that it doesn't affect the livelihood of particular members of of the the the, the bars uh, of, of 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 Scotland. I'm sure it does, and, and uh, but I think on the macro level, the the significance is, has probably been rather small. So just to reiterate, from your point of view, and, and from my own previous experience before I became a member of a parliament, um, you talk to your corporate lawyer, if you've got one, that they end up speaking to another lawyer who's maybe in one jurisdiction to speak to another lawyer in another jurisdiction. That's just continued as it did before. Brexit has made no difference whatsoever. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I would say so. And so in terms of opportunities for legal services, um, within uh, uh, the context of, of us dealing with commercial transactions, with contract-related issues, things are pretty much as they were. Yes, I, I think it was uh, adapting to the change was a business cost, and I think that caused a lot of anxiety in, in, in what we, we, we can call a transi transition period, as in small t, small p, not the transition period. Uh, 
And now that the ad adaptation is, I, I think, beginning to settle down, I don't really think there's going to be a massive difference, personally. And going just quickly back to Dr. Marx, you said that the solicitors based in Scotland who are used to flying in and flying out, in the period since Brexit, they've established a way of working around all of this where they need to, whether it's in relation to visas or, or whatever. But but there are still things that can be improved. I think, I think that that's fair to a degree, and that I, I would sort of slightly push back on the sense that it, it, it's all turned out all right, so to speak. I, th I think, you know, uh, Dr Anderson clearly outlined some of the things yeah. we have lost from yeah. this process. Um, I think it is fair to say that a lot of law firms have proved quite adept and nimble at working their way into this. I think it's fair to say a lot of the individuals concerned have proved quite adept and nimble and, to some extent, um, a pretty significant financial cost to get around some of these problems. I think it is also fair to say that without the mobility that was there before or which we could try to rebuild, the business opportunities just won't develop in the way that right. they did. And I think that sort of idea of looking to the future, I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly different, but again, sort of in terms of youth mobility, like who is going to go out on intercorporate transfers, this sort of thing, what, what is the interests of people? And then will those contacts and clients build? It is, as you point out, a, a business where you have those personal relationships and you meet people. And if you're just not doing that, yeah. that's not going to build. And I think that's the sort of issue going forwards. And one last question, convener, and that is around uh, other jurisdictions outside of the European Union that have shown a path to making this even better than it's currently assessed to be. I mean, for example, the one from a commercial point of view, and I'm not sure if it's true legally, so that's why I'm asking, is, is Switzerland, which is outside of the European Union, but has, has a long-term relationship of almost constant negotiating and nudging in order to try and smooth things out. I, I, is there something we can learn from Switzerland, or is there another jurisdiction that we can see as a bit of a trailblazer in this? I think we're going to be very different to all of them, just because of our size and proximity to a yeah. degree. Um, I, th I think what we can learn from Switzerland is that we'll be talking about this for a very long time. Yes. In, in, that, I think we can all agree on that, yeah. <laughs> d d d d Dr Anderson, do you want to say anything? I, I don't have much to add, although I had some knowledge of the Swiss position. And the, I suppose the fundamental difference there is that, although they're also not in the EEA, they are an EFTA state. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. And Professor Collins, anything you want to add? I yeah, a few comments to add. I think. Uh, two, two things. If there's a jurisdiction that you want to look for inspiration, look at the extent to which the UK has tried to achieve recognition and, and mobility with respect to the United States, where you have 50, 51, if you include Washington, D.C., 51 jurisdictions uh, governed at the state level. In a, in a sense, quite similar to the, to the 27 uh, member state issue at, at the EU. And there hasn't been much success at all. Now, that some of the, the uh, US states uh, allow British qualified, uh, educated lawyers to take the bar exams, but, but it's, it's not much. Um, but there, there, is, there is sort of a route there with some of the states. And this has been something that the Law Society of England and Wales has been trying to chip away at for years. And the other one, uh, we, we tried it with India and had a little bit of success there. So it, at the at this the sort of state level, sub sub state level, there there may be some some progress. So, I think it would be a question of trying to maintain open dialogue with each of the EU member states and see how far they're willing to take this. But I think rather than looking jurisdictionally, an interesting illustrative example would be to look at another profession. And the profession that that's that's most instructive here is architectures. Perhaps uh, the committee knows about this. Uh, so there was going to be a mutual recognition agreement for architects between the UK uh, and the EU. This this was going to be the the groundbreaking mutual recognition agreement, uh, and it uh, it didn't go through. the The EU pulled away from it because uh, they they were unhappy with the terms uh, of it. And the, the sense, my sense from speaking to people, is uh, as I think I said earlier. The EU doesn't seem to be interested in mutual recognition agreements in, in, in the sort of the sweeping sense 
that, that are going to cover all of the member states. But perhaps more worryingly, my understanding is the EU Commission also doesn't like the member states negotiating M MRAs on their own. So it, it, there's there's a lot of sort of internal European politics going on there. The architects couldn't do it. And, and to me, I'm not an architect, but I wouldn't think that that would have the same issues that we would have as lawyers, which by nature are jurisdictionally specific. So if the architects couldn't get it, why would legal services get it? I, I'm I'm a bit pessimistic that there's going to be a, 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 any kind of formal mutual recognition uh, at, at the sort of pan-EU level that applies, that, that can filter down to the member states. But I, that doesn't mean we should stop trying. We absolutely should. And the frameworks are there. The committees are there. And and I, I would wish the best of luck to to anyone that's advocating on behalf of that. Thank you. Thank you. If I could ask a quick supplementary on, on that basis, you, you both, um, everyone's mentioned the, the overhead costs and the business costs to actually work in their way around the regulations. This is something we saw when we were doing the the, the goods, the trade of goods um, inquiry. And um, what, what we saw there was that bigger organisations such as Scottish Salmon were more able to absorb those costs. But for some of our smaller manufacturers, um, they just had stopped trading with the EU, EU because they couldn't you know, um, uh, absorb the costs in terms of the, the size of business. I understand that you're saying you don't have a lot of data on the on the actual numbers and the volume of the of of the um, um, legal work that was happening, but have you had indications from members that um, this has affected smaller firms in a way it hasn't maybe affected some of the bigger um, firms in Edinburgh? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, it, it's a slightly difficult question just because the structure of the Scottish solicitor market, we do have some medium firms, but there's quite a lot of very small high street solicitors and then a few mm. very larger firms. And so it, it, with that caveat aside, I think inevitably smaller firms will struggle more than larger firms. But equally, it, it does very much depend on the firm. Like some of the smaller firms are sort of very niche focused boutique firms looking at a specific topic, at which point they've probably been fine then again to, to at least understand the issues. And again, this is then who would then in the future start to develop and, and set that up and, and, and what structures are going to be around that. Um, I mean, in particular, sort of referring this, I did a sort of survey of our EU members. So these are then not just the firms, they're the individuals that have ended up in various places about you know, what they have done post-Brexit. And I think I caught them all in a sort of slightly sort of whimsical mood, almost looking back on this, because it's sort of with everyone getting to the end of this. And, you know, this is where things like youth mobility schemes like Erasmus actually did get mentioned by sort of you know, senior partners at firms as a sort of a, well, I never came here originally to be a solicitor. I came here on something else that I just happened to be here for, and then it's developed. So I think that sort of, again, looking to the future um, for building up businesses and indeed just anything else, I think, I think that's sort of the structures that we can hang around that are important. I are there any other sources of, of data or, or, or um, information in this area that the committee could look at to, to, to gauge what the scale of, of the change has been? I mean, from, from our perspective, we're all independent sole traders, so we're independent professionals in that regard, so you can't really get a smaller business than a, essentially a one-man or one-woman band. Um, but we're also all independent professionals in the sense of Annex 22, which was mentioned earlier. So the issues around contractual um, um, uh, the, the defined terms in Annex 22 don't don't arise for us. Um, on a practical level, though, you mean what one can do is to see the number of applicants that have been to the Irish legal profession from the United Kingdom in the last few years, to see the extent to which it's sufficient of an issue for um, those who are professionally qualified in the United Kingdom to look to become qualified elsewhere. And no doubt um, Irish colleagues might be able to help you in relation to that. There are certainly some of our members who have done that. Um, there are others who have joined, for example, the Belgian bar. So j just at the level of the individual, um, there are some who have had to go elsewhere, essentially, to get the professional qualification to allow them to do what they want to do. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, could I bring in Mr Brown, please? 
Hey, thanks, Convener. Uh, one uh, fairly uh, quick question. I think it's probably an obvious answer, and I should probably know, but uh, it's to do with the second question that um, Stephen Kerr asked about reciprocity. Um, obviously, it's been a complete mess in terms of the good side of things, where UK suppliers um, have had the restrictions of Brexit imposed, and yet the same restrictions not, not been imposed for various reasons, infrastructure and so on, um, on EU um, coming in, EU goods coming to the country. Is there um, the reciprocity in relation to services as it affects your organisations, has that been observed? Is there any sense in which it's one-sided, or has it been pretty well observed in terms of the areas in which you're restricted from going into the EU? Has that been observed on EU representatives coming to this country, in your experience? Um, I think the position that we had was pre-Brexit, there was rep reciprocity, and post-Brexit there isn't, and I don't think I can think of examples whereby it's now become one-sided. One I mean, as a jurisdiction in Scotland, you can do uh, under home title international law and everything as you can in the EU without registering with us. One of the questions we regularly get is how many EU lawyers are in Scotland and the answer is we don't honestly know because they don't have to register with the Law Society of Scotland unless they want to do something that is reserved to the activities of Scottish solicitors. Um, so I, I think to a degree no. Um, in terms of the sort of access requirements, that's sort of home office visa regimes um, and questions going forwards on, on, on what that looks like. But, yeah. You're now straying a little from my area of expertise if we're moving to the home office visa regimes, I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know if you've had Professor Collins. Uh, I, I, don't, I think that's correct, what, what's been said. Uh, England and Wales have al always had a very open uh, legal uh, profession. I, I qualify. My law degree is from Canada, and and, and I did a two-hour exam to to get qualified uh, as a solicitor. And uh, fine, you know, you've got common law overlaps. But I think uh, as jurisdictions go, uh, certainly England and Wales. I couldn't speak to Scotland, but England and Wales is has been among the most open in the world for allowing foreign. Um, people with foreign qualifications to come and practice law here. And, and, and I would say probably to its credit, and it, it, it's, it's a great parallel uh, that, that you uh, made, uh, Mr. Brown, with relation to goods. I, I think you, what you said is, is more or less true. The UK opened up its doors to, to European goods, and yet the other way around, there were all these restrictions. Now, an economist would probably tell you that free trade is good, uh, good whether or not it's reciprocal, that we will get the benefits of these cheap EU goods. And if you can play that out to services, well, we get all these amazing lawyers co uh, coming in that, that can um, increase the, the level of competition, the quality, and, and, and so on. The problem is is that you, you surrender your bargaining chips. So, for, for example, I don't see – I think I said this earlier – I don't see what, what the UK could exchange uh, for, for greater access uh, for, to the uh, European – uh, legal profession. What what would that be uh, that that we would s surrender to get that? Uh, so, so that that I don't know. That's that's a much larger debate. That's probably on the remit of this committee. Uh, but I, I think if things stand right now, it it seems to be fairly consistent in terms of reciprocity on legal services. Yeah, I think a lot of economists wouldn't agree with um, structurally imposed uh, lack of reciprocity. Um, if you can put it that way. The other question I've got really is. Um, some of the comments that Dr Anderson made about the achievements of, I think, the Faculty and the Law Society in relation to getting uh, agreements in other countries when they wanted to be able to be um, involved in those countries. I just wonder, I mean, in my view, Brexit has been a complete disaster, to be honest. Um, and also to hear Professor Collins talk about slightly above GATT level or WTO level is just a disaster, I think, for the economy. And we're seeing that in terms of the lost billions. However, it's now some time since it happened. And, you know, not so much time since the, um, the agreement happened. But surely it should be possible for many of these agreements to be done more quickly, and all these things tend not to move very fast. And I suppose what I'm interested in is, as most politicians would be, is accountability. Who who should we be looking to? And I'm probably asking the wrong people here. Who who should we be looking to for that 
lack of progress is an extent to which the organisations themselves could be doing much more to get um, the recognition that they're looking for? Or is it structurally very difficult to do that without member state involvement? Um, I just think, in my experience, both in Scotland and the UK, many organisations, because of this system that we have here, wait for the government to move on lots of things. Is it not possible for organisations to do more in the meantime? Or is it structurally difficult or a resource question? Mr. Anderson, uh, Dr. Anderson first, if I can. Um, it may depend on what we are talking about. Um, s some of the issues that I highlighted at the beginning, you know, what is the definition of designated legal services um, and so on, in the TCA, these are really issues at an EU level. It's difficult to see how anyone below that negotiating level can influence it, other than through the appropriate channels in relation to the domestic advisory group and so on. Um, but I, I don't really see that as something that we can negotiate with, you know, the the um, the Anwaltskammer in Berlin or something to try and sort that out. It's not within their gift. Um, I think what I was referring to. Um, earlier uh, was really much more in the practical um, level um, in relation to um, cooperation um, that one sees in professional bodies throughout the world, that where one has professional colleagues, and particularly in Europe where we essentially have a shared legal tradition and with whom we have uh, um, long-standing ties and links um, that, that those are continuing irrespective of what's happening um, politically. Um, and therefore, in relation to your question of you know, who, who's accountable, I think it depends what we're talking about. And um, you know, mutual recognition of professional qualifications and so on, these are also big issues because they have implications more widely and internationally in relation to other WTO partners. Um, and there are also aspects internal to the United Kingdom. You know, within the United Kingdom, of course, we, we have different jurisdictions, and there's not, you know, an English barrister doesn't appear in Scottish courts, and I can't appear in the English courts, and so on. So, um, you know, there, there's a wider context to all of that, um, and um, I, th I think in terms of who, who we hold accountable, um, um, I, I feel we may not be the, the right people to ask whatever our own personal views might be. Dr. Marks. Yeah, I mean. I, I, not a huge amount, a huge amount about specifically on that. In terms of examples of the kind of work that we have done as representative bodies on, on, on our own, that we, we have done sort of, we have sought sort of memoranda of understanding with other bars and law societies. For instance, particularly post Brexit, we've worked with Belgium, um, with the bars and law societies of Brussels and, and, and then wider across the country. Um, these processes definitely do take time. Um, I mean, we, we had an MOU before Brexit, and we are now hopefully coming to the conclusion of updating it as a sort of post-Brexit MOU. Um, I, I believe the latest hope is that we'll, we'll sign it sometime this year, maybe next year. It's sort of early next year. This is one of those ones, that, again, because there is all of the individual bars, law societies, regulators across the UK and then across Belgium, where they have more than us, as many as us. Um, the, Agreement from everyone just involves a certain degree of time to this. I don't think that means it's not worth trying these 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 agreements to at least bring everyone to the room and talk. And it sort of brings up a wider question about any agreement, particularly from a services point of view, needs support afterwards. You know, the reality is, in terms of goods, there is an element to if you change a barrier, it it is sort of solved. It doesn't require a huge amount of effort afterwards, except promoting that you've done it, so companies can take advantage of it. In terms of services, a lot of this involves conversations between regulators. You know, it's slightly different, for example, in the terms of the Australia trade deal that was signed by the UK. There is a legal services regulatory dialogue between us and the various bars and law societies in Australia. There is a resource question about how many of these individual you know, regulators and representative bodies can attend, how much capacity we have, and what support from government comes to those. And I think it's important that we don't forget that having got through the excitement of signing the deal because from a services side the advantage is done by the work afterwards not really the work before thanks very much and professor collins at some distance and maybe more able to point a finger of accountability do you think there's more that could be done by non-governmental um, service bodies to advance their interests or 
Do you think it really has to wait on uh, a revisal of the uh, trade agreement, which, of course, once it's done, that'll be there for another few years? Is, is, is there more of a role for, for the organisations to get involved themselves and to achieve what they want to achieve without the government necessarily being involved? Well, as the other witnesses said, I, th I think there is a role. And my experience with the Law Society of England and Wales is they were doing a fantastic job. That, that, that organization ha had contacts all over the world, bars of 200-plus jurisdictions. They were always sending out missions uh, to, to various places. So much work was put into the Indian MOU that I think they, I think it was finally some kind of an MOU with India. So yes, there's there's work that the the, the, the that these organisations can can do, uh, and, and I think there's there's progress that can be achieved there. But ultimately, it does come down to, to the uh, to the elected representatives and the the redrafting, if that's what transpires, of the TCA, and especially the work in the TCA committee. So one of my uh, criticisms, I would say, how the TCA has unfolded is there were so many of these committees created. And my sense is that they haven't met with the regularity, as in had meetings with the regularity that they were meant to do. I checked out this, um, the Trade and Services and, and Digital Trade Committee, something of, of that, uh, it's, the name is something like that. They seem to only be meeting once a year, and the minutes that I could see didn't really achieve much. So I, I, would, I think maybe... Uh, the framework is there, but I wonder is the will perhaps not quite there uh, to, to, to have it, to have these meetings actually uh, achieve uh, concrete solutions. Just a very quick come back on. You mentioned the Indian um, MOU. I know there's no trade agreement with India um, even yet, but that, that MOU is something that's active and producing benefits now, because if it is, then it shows that you can do these things out with trade agreements. I don't know... Uh, about specifically the MOU with India, what exactly happened. But to answer your, your more general question, yes, you don't need a free trade agreement to have an MOU. You don't need a free trade, trade agreement to have a mutual recognition agreement. You can have a standalone mutual recognition agreement that floats around outside of a free trade agreement that was specifically contemplated under GATS. Uh, and uh, that's there are a number of those in place. They're more associated with goods, but you absolutely could have an MRA uh, apart from a, a free trade agreement. Thanks, Camilla. Thank you. Um, can I, I just ask a, a little bit about um, as, uh, Ireland and, and the, the issue of um, people registering with the bar in Ireland, um, uh, because that's one of the aspects of, of um, what we've been looking at is, is the difference between uh, or any detriment to businesses in Scotland as compared to Northern Ireland, who, of course, are in the free trade agreement at the moment still. Um, so, um, could you just maybe expand on that? In, in, in the, what's the benefit to the Scottish lawyers of registering? Is there a mutual recognition between Ireland and Scotland uh, in the terms of what we've just been talking about? And uh, maybe just explain that a little bit more for us. Um, is there mutual recognition? The short answer to that is basically no. Um, there are certain, I understand it. Um, mutual recognition between England and Ireland. And what tends to happen is that Scottish lawyers will get dual qualified in England and will then use the appropriate route. But I don't understand it to be automatic to seek qualification in Ireland. I I Ireland has, has, has become the obvious route for many London-based colleagues as well because of shared language um, and a similar system, particularly to, to England. The reason for doing it, though, is because Ireland is a member state of the European Union. If you are therefore admitted as a lawyer in a European Union country, subject to issues of free movement in terms of your passport and, and visa requirements, you therefore have a right of audience before the EU courts, and you can provide advice in EU law to um, not just EU-based clients, but often international clients who have operations um, in the EU and you can ensure that the advice that is provided is pr subject to legal professional privilege. So that's the, that's the rationale for colleagues who have sought to become admitted in that so jurisdiction. So effectively they're taking their business from, from Scotland or England to the, the, Ireland? They may be. What the precise arrangements are in terms of their own establishment and where they're invoicing from and where they're paying tax is, a, is, is not something I can comment on. I don't, it may, may vary depending on each individual. Um, um, concerned. Thank you. Uh, Dr Marks, have you anything? I think, 
not a huge amount to add. I, I would, and I'm, I'm loath to go into it today, at least in part because I haven't got my notes in front of me on this. So if, if anyone had specific questions, I'd, I'd, I, I could get back afterwards. Um, but there has been some shifts and change in how the route to qualification via Ireland has worked. Um, the Irish Law Society changed some of their practices for handing out certificates for Irish listers in the EU shortly post-Brexit, which I know did cause some problems for those that had qualified with, with, with Irish certificates. Um, certainly, I know in the case of a number of our members who worked on EU law, they went down the Belgium route instead, um, which is you know now sort of... I think we've got another year or so before they finally come out at the end of that process and will be then fully qualified EU lawyers. Um, but yeah, no, so I, I just, if anyone did want, I could probably get back to you afterwards. But yeah, I do, I do know that the Irish route has had its hiccups, shall we say. And just, just, just to fully under, understand, if, if someone's based in Northern Ireland, can they bill from Northern Ireland in a way that a Scottish company or individual couldn't because they're based? in Northern Ireland, or is that something we have to get an answer from elsewhere? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think even if you reformulated it, I'm not sure I'd be in a position to answer it. OK. OK. Do, uh, Professor Collins, do you want to...? Uh, yeah. Just quickly on, on the Irish issue, uh, for, for what it's worth, anecdotally, uh, again, when I was uh, a member of the International Committee of the Law Society of England and Wales, there was a flurry of activity of uh, English uh, lawyers getting qualified in Ireland. It, it was a, a huge uptake, and I remember seeing the numbers, and it was quite remarkable. And then it, it, it there was a change, uh, as as uh, Dr. Marks alluded to, and then it, it died out. Uh, so uh, that that was my experience witnessing that from afar. On Northern Ireland, um, that's that's complicated. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland is is more or less remaining inside the the EU single market. I'm not quite sure if the establishment directive will therefore apply. That's a good question. I'm not sure about that. That would probably be fairly easy to get an answer to. If you were qualified in Northern Ireland, would you still have rights of audience before the, the European Court of Justice? I suspect that you probably would. I imagine it would still apply, yes. Okay, thank you. That's something we'll certainly be looking into to some clarity on that issue. Mr Bibby. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, Erasmus was mentioned, I think, most recently by, by Mr. Marks. Um, you know, clearly there's issues in terms of an impact around withdrawing from Erasmus in terms of opportunities for young people generally, but opportunities for law students from, from Scotland uh, and, and the whole of the UK. Um, obviously, an impact in the EU as well, but. Um, and, uh, and helping to achieve those qualifications that can be recognised in, 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 in the first place. Um, I wondered, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, your thoughts on, on, on the extent to that impact in terms of opportunities and actually achieving the qualifications in terms of law, uh, the legal profession, but also have you any thoughts on the, the replacement programmes in terms of Erasmus that we've seen and, and, and the extent to there's been a delay in a replacement um, programme in Scotland, but um, Wales has made, I think, more progress. I don't know if there's any, has there been any impact on, on, on sort of opportunities for, for law students or uh, lawyers in Wales as a result of that? I mean, I suspect in terms of law students specifically, it's going to be a very similar tale to students in general. Mm -hmm. um, I think yep. there is a, a long-term impact from that in terms of, as I say, if people aren't going to other universities, countries studying, then they don't then build up the contacts, the links to end up working with those people in the longer term. It's, it's, they're not seeing them as clients at that point, they're friends and contacts, but it, it develops down the line, obviously. Um, in terms of Erasmus, I mean, broadly speaking, we're, be delighted to see a, a rejoining of something like that um, and I'm happy to be supportive of that. Um, but it, I don't know if there's anything more specific I could add. Um, Mr. Anderson. Um, I mean, the question about youth mobility generally, of which Erasmus forms traditionally a really significant part, um, is, is a wider one. Um, there's much that could be said about the Erasmus programme in universities um, from a previous life as an academic um, and the, the roles which the Scottish law schools in particular had, but I think I'm probably not best place to talk about that today. What I can say from the faculty's perspective is the one empirical example we have in relation to youth mobility is that for about 40 years we ran a scheme known as the Euro Devils scheme, which allowed young 
I mean, there was there was no age limit, but they were generally young European lawyers um, to come um, and spend time uh, in Scotland for a period of months. It was an exchange. It had originally been funded, I think, by the British Council and then the Scottish Government. Latterly, there was no government funding, but the programme continued, at least until um, COVID. Um, that scheme, which ran for about 40 years and has hundreds of alumni all over Europe who meet annually, who participated in the scheme in Edinburgh, that, that scheme's just come to an end at the moment because of uncertainty around um, particular freedom of movement, visas, do we need to be an immigration sponsor, they're not providing services, where do they fit within all of that? So, I mean, that's the one example that w w we have of a scheme that we ran, which has, has just run into um, inertia and bureaucracy as a result of, of where we now are. Um, and that, um, so, um, yeah, I think that's the main example we have of youth mobility um, and the difficulties that we've experienced. Thank you. And, and I don't know if Professor I, Collins has got... Yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak to that. Uh, I'm not disappointed with the end of Erasmus, personally, and I, I work for a university. I think the Turing scheme is a much better scheme. Britain was losing money on Erasmus. It, it, was, uh, it was a waste. I, I, I went on Erasmus visits myself, so I, I'm someone that benefited from it. I, I, I took trips to Europe. The Turing scheme that replaced it is much better. The Turing scheme is only for students, so faculty like me can't use it. Why should I be getting a grant to go to Iceland as a working professional? I, I, I took it and I enjoyed it, but I, I, I don't think it was value for money. Far more Europeans used Erasmus to come here than, than British people, British students went into Europe. The Turing scheme is, is, is very good. I, I, I think it was a, an, a good example of, of where um, savings were made from Brexit. And, and, I'm, and people have fond memories of Erasmus. Again, so do I personally. But I think the, the Turing scheme that replaced it is just as good, and it has excellent opportunities for, for young people uh, to go to Europe uh, during their studies on exchange programs. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm not quite sure the relevance of that discussion to, to this committee or our topic today, uh, but, but uh, more broadly, I, 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 I'm not disappointed about uh, the, the termination of the Erasmus project. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, th th thanks for that answer. Thank you. Um. Okay, um, Latter point, yep. if I may. I mean, mm -hmm. I I'm here for the Faculty of Advocates and so can't speak to that. Um, I think all I would say from my own experience of working in Scottish law schools is I'm not sure the latter view that's just expressed would necessarily be reflective of others in Scottish law schools, but I think you would need to take the evidence of, of, of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions from members? Yeah. Oh, Keith, yep. Yeah. ...for students was the stagiar system, which was very successful and used by many students to get real experience over in uh, Brussels with virtually no salary. But um, it was very useful. And, of course, because I'm no longer a member of the EU, we can't use those um, opportunities anymore. Just pointing that out. Come here. Um, I, was, I was just going to um, wind up um, with a final question. Um, uh, particularly probably to Dr Marks and Dr Anderson, eh, and thank you for mentioning the previous work of the committee and the fact that you're now on the domestic advisory group. Why was that such an important step for you, and what do you see as your role going forward within that group? Um, in the wider discussion of the legal services market within the United Kingdom, there is a tendency sometimes, I think, when one talks about UK legal services, for there to be a very London-centric focus. And that what is said to um, be appropriate and suitable for the interests of the London legal market just apply automatically across the United Kingdom. Um, as I've indicated, the, the internal constitutional setup of the United Kingdom um, from uh, its inception preserved the Scottish legal system um, as a separate jurisdiction. We have our own professional bodies and our own providers of legal services. Um, to that extent, therefore, um, it was always felt important that the constituent uh, professional bodies within the United Kingdom um, who make up the legal services market were all um, equally represented. Um, and particularly in, in relation to EU um, 
relations um, where the contribution of Scottish lawyers in particular, whether as judges of the Court of Justice or those who have worked there, um, ha has been significant in the past. Um, and as a legal system, we think we have something to offer uh, to the wider discussion in relation to services. So, um, as I say, we, we were grateful for the support that, that um, uh, was afforded to us to allow us to, to, to participate in that way. Um, and uh, we certainly foresee going forward um, that we uh, will be able simply to re reflect the um, positions and challenges that our own members face um, in the, the, the post-Brexit TCA world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably don't have a huge amount to, to add, frankly. I think you summed it up very well. Um, I think ultimately the domestic advisory group is one of the sort of higher decision-making bodies, as much as there are decision-making bodies, advisory bodies around the TCA. Um, I think it is very useful for the Scottish jurisdiction to have a voice there. I think it is very appropriate that we have a voice there. And yeah, we will be able to, to, to represent our members going forwards in a way that was not possible. Um, and I, I, I'm, I think it was you know, summed up best when the domestic advisory group did meet in Edinburgh, and this was before we were members, and we were sat in the jurisdiction in which the domestic advisory group was meeting as observers in the corner of the room, which was curious. Um, so I think it is nice that that, that has been resolved, and I, I look forward to hopefully many years um, of the two of us working together on it. That, that's very helpful. Um, Professor Collins, Dr Anderson, Dr Marks, thank you very much for your time as a committee this morning. And uh, I think that's the end of our meeting. So um, thank you again. <laughs>